Dr. Lisa Evangelista is an associate professor and the director of speech pathology at the UC Davis Medical Center, Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. She provides comprehensive diagnostics and contemporary management of swallowing dysfunction, following surgical interventions and radiation therapy for head and neck cancer. Her research focuses on improving functional clinical outcomes following surgical and medical treatments. Her academic interests include swallowing physiology, following radiation therapy, a laryngeal voice rehab after total laryngectomy and quality of life outcomes following surgical and medical interventions in head and neck oncology. In addition to lecturing nationally and internationally on diagnostics and therapeutics and swallowing, she has authored peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on dysphagia and head and neck cancer and is the editor of a book on laryngectomy rehabilitation soon to come. Keep your eye out. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Happy Dysphagia Awareness Month, everybody. And thank you for the Stanford crew for the invitation to speak. Um, I kind of feel like I missed the mark on the theme. I was like, okay, patient care. I'm going to talk about silent aspiration, but we'll wrap it back up with the patient advocacy talk after. Um, but I was a, a little bit motivated when I was creating this talk because I was listening to Boston. And I don't know if any of you know that lovely band Boston, they're hit more than a feeling. Felt like it really tied in with the theme of this talk, so we're just going to roll with it. So for the next 12, 15 minutes, we're going to talk about mechanisms of silent aspiration. And so when we look at these swallow studies, usually the first place our mind goes to is oof, silent aspiration, PAS score of eight. They don't feel any of that. Um, and we know very well what silent aspiration can do in terms of health outcomes increasing the risk of aspiration pneumonias. But oftentimes our field of view goes to, they don't feel it. It is a sensory impairment issue. But I'm gonna challenge you a little bit to think about other associated factors for silent aspiration. And so here are some potential etiologies. We're gonna delve into each of these deeper of why a patient may aspirate and not feel it. So why they may be quote unquote, a silent aspirator. So the first one we're going to kick it off with are just some basics. Let's talk about sensory innervation to the larynx. We have a lot of mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors that stimulate the glottis above and below. So when we're thinking about mechanoreceptors, these are the sensory receptors that are responsive to touch stimuli. And when we think about chemoreceptors within the airways, these are the sensory receptors responsible for chemical changes within the body. And when we look at breaking up the larynx in between above the glottis, below the glottis, the part that's responsible for stimulation to the larynx above the glottis is the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. When we're thinking below the glottis, our sensory component is brought in by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so when we think about damage to these nerves, it can be from various reasons. Number one, neurological insult, stroke, traumatic brain injury, Airway desensitization. Our patients with a long history of smoking, chronic exposure to that, that irritant, chronic aspiration. You know, sometimes we see patients early on in their disease process where they're coughing. They got that PAS score of seven. And then over time, you see them as years go by and you're like, ah, they're insensate now. Why are they all of a sudden silent aspirators? And usually sometimes the body's like, okay, I'm trying to trigger a cough. You keep throwing stuff down my lungs, I'm finally just going to go quiet when we get that desensitization effect. And then really common, a hallmark of late toxicities of radiation therapy is that profound laryngeal sensory neuropathy, where patients after radiation are doing really well after treatment. They kind of hit that five-year post-radiation mark, and then they develop sensory laryngeal neuropathies. When we think about the diminished cough reflex, there are a number of really sophisticated and eloquent studies that corroborate our patients with the pneumonia oftentimes have an attenuated cough reflex. And this was demonstrated in NIMI's study, which they took inhalatory irritants. And what they found is that in patients who had histories of pneumonias, but not a lot of etiology for their pneumonia, they actually had much higher thresholds to those irritants when inhaled in response to patients that did not have the pneumonia. So that really tells us that that cough sensation, that cough reflex is extremely important and a defense against the development of any type of pneumonia, not just aspiration pneumonia. 
And let's talk about age. The one thing that we all don't like to talk about, but we just got to be honest, none of us are getting any younger. Age is not on our side when it comes to cough attenuation, because we actually know that there's a cortical underpinning. So the older you get, the more likely you are to have a decreased cough reflux. And this has been shown time and time and again, a lot by um, Ebihara's study. When they looked at frail elderly individuals, they actually had really limited cough reflexes and unfortunately a much higher increase of developed any type of pneumonia. Substance P, I had to go dig a lot about what substance P, because I don't think this is oftentimes something uh, that we learned in grad school, but I don't know if anybody of you, like me, my mind wanders, I'm like substance P would be a great name for a band. <laughs> and sure enough, I was like typing in a spot by sub substance P pops up. It is a actual like techno electronic group. They're, they're pretty good. Um, but substance P is a sensory neuropeptide that serves as an inflammatory mediator within the airway. And so it lines the epithelium of the airway. And what it actually does is it becomes an inflammatory mediator, which is responsible for cough and also bronchoconstriction. And so substance P elicits a cough reflux when an irritant is introduced into the airway. And when we look at our patient population, Parkinson's disease, stroke, those patients, interestingly, on sputum levels have reduced substance P levels. So they have that reduced inflammatory mediator response and a reduced protective response within the bronchodilators, or sorry, the bronchoconstrictors and the cough reflex. And the ACE inhibitor, a commonly prescribed medication, we'll get into that to a little bit, but interestingly, ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme, reduces substance P levels within the body. So when you think about, hmm, can we inversely uh, reverse that? ACE inhibitors can actually induce a cough reflex. And in some individuals, some certain patient populations specifically studied in stroke, have found that the use of an ACE inhibitor actually increases cough reflex and lowers aspiration-related mortality. So use it with a grain of salt. It can be a little bit protective in certain patient populations to in regularly induce a cough reflux that would have otherwise been degraded. And then when we think about impaired neuromuscular control, so here we go talking about maybe a motor component to our silent aspirators. We know that they have decreased sensation in the larynx, potentially decreased substance P levels, Maybe they don't have a great urge to cough, but what about our patients with neuromuscular impairments, such as spinal cord injury, stroke, sarcopenia, which we're all at risk of as we, once again, that A word, aging. Um, and so when we think, we're gonna cover the cough reflex here. When we think about our patients that maybe have a cough impaired reflex, they could be impaired at any one of these levels. The inspiratory phase where we're priming our lungs, we're filling our lungs up with a good, robust amount of air. And then we move on to the compressive phase where we shut our vocal folds off, we close our glottis then to really generate subglottic pressure. And then we move on to the expiratory phase where we have this really robust response of expiratory exhalation to kick out whatever went down into the wrong pipe. Along any of those avenues, our patients can be impaired from a neuromuscular issue, such as diaphragmatic or chest wall impairment. So that's something that we also need to consider when we're looking at whether a patient may be a silent aspirator or not. And so other considerations, our response or our patient's response, and even within ourselves, can be variable. And so it may not be uncommon that you give a patient a 10 milliliter barium bolus, they don't aspirate, they're total, or they don't feel their aspiration, they're totally silent. And then you give them another, maybe 15 milliliter bolus, and then they're coughing their heads off. Why does that happen? Because there's a lot of variability. Humans are complex. One day they may feel it, the next day they may not. And then interestingly, and this is from Miles, um, Anna Miles from New Zealand, her data found that the prevalence of silent aspiration is higher with thickened liquids in comparison to thin liquids. And so when you think about how routinely thickened liquids are recommended for patients with dysphagia, it's interestingly that that is associated more often with silent aspiration. There's not a lot to really substantiate why that may happen. 
some potential theories are when we're going to talk about the theory of spatial summation is when we think about the viscosity of how a thin liquid travels, travels very quick compared to a nectar thick or a honey thick, and thus maybe enters more deeply into the airways, thus triggering a cough response versus maybe the patient aspirated in nectar thick consistency is moving a little bit slower, still goes past the glottis as aspiration, but maybe it's not far enough to trigger a cough reflux for that particular patient. And also, um, let's talk about the theory of spatial summation. And so when we think about physics, spatial summation, this indicates that a cough response is much more likely to be triggered by the space and the, the heaviness or the heft that it takes up. And so when we think about small aspiration versus large aspiration, that larger volume of aspiration is going to take up much more within the airway system. That's being the theory of spatial summation. So taking up more space within the airway, they're much more likely to trigger a cough response. And so just to wrap up some points about this, I think to keep in our pockets when we see our patients at bedside or when we're doing clinical swallow evaluations, or even making recommendations for our patients that silent aspiration is often multifactorial. So not just a sensory and afferent issue, but also an efferent component triggered by lack of urge to cough or inability from a muscular standpoint. And the response to aspiration may be variable from day to day within the patients, across consistencies, across volumes. So the important part is not just to hang your hat on a recommendation made by one instance, but to really take a poll or a large gathering of what you are doing for the patient in terms of assessment and what they are, what they are producing as responses for you. And then also, unfortunately, the likelihood of sensed aspiration increase as the volume of aspiration increases. So once ago, again, go into that theory of spatial summation, that even though you may give a small volume, that patient doesn't elicit that cough response, maybe you want to delve a little bit deeper and see if they do truly, are they truly insensate, or maybe they will trigger a cough response to some degree that you can work with by giving a bigger bolus for that patient. So I'm happy to answer any questions or feel free to shoot me an email.